Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House U.S. to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode nine, Lucid Diamond. The Tibetan Book of Natural Liberation Through Learning in the Between is uh, really marvelous, and it comes from those depth psychology people, the tantrics, yogis. It's now known in the West that you can train someone, most people, if they will make the effort to develop what's called lucid dreaming. And there are clinics in Sanford. There was one in Sanford for a while, and there was one in Maimonides Hospital in uh, Brooklyn for a while. I don't know actually currently who's doing it, but um, there's a literature about it. And um, lucid dreaming means you train yourself to become aware in a dream that you're dreaming, and then without waking up, you can begin to consciously react to things and construct things and learn things and deal with things in dreams. Now, Freudians might be freaked about that because they think it's important that you not be in control of what's going on in a dream because the, you, things will come out of your unconscious if you can then at least remember them. So they feel that you shouldn't, that's kind of wrong direction to learn to try to be conscious that I'm now in a dream. This is me still, whatever, my conscious personality, and I'm now in a dream. And now I want to go learn something. I want to go to the Louvre in my dream, <laughs> get in without paying a ticket and look at Mona Lisa, and without worrying about the crowd. But just as you can do that, you can train yourself to lucidly die and therefore remain conscious through the process of going down through that dark. Remember last night I said about sleeping, moonlight space, sunlit space, darklit space, clearlit space, this gray diamond transparency space. And you can be conscious that you're in those points of consciousness. And then in the area where the 80 instincts are, which is in those three subtle mind things, there are these, these 80 instinctual surges, you can become aware of how they function and how the energies swirl in there, and you can calm them and so forth, and you can become conscious in your control of them, and you can ride those energies. And to do that, you use these different dream state embodiments. You know, for example, there's a famous thing about the Taoist Zhuangzi who said, last night I dreamed I was a butterfly, and now today I don't know if I'm a butterfly dreaming I'm a human, I went awake human, or I'm a human who had a dream of last night I was a butterfly. So that means he had a deep kind of lucid dream of himself as having the body of a butterfly and the perception of a butterfly. It means, unless he was just making it up. So you create different ways of perceiving in that dream state within which you can look at these different instinctual surges and you can learn to master them and not react to them in a certain way, etc. You can surf them, something like that. You can't necessarily completely destroy them uh, because there will never be nothing. Causality will always continue at the subtle or coarse or super subtle level. It will. But you can learn to surf it. You, know, you can learn to deal with it. And so these are the people who had those abilities and who got into simulated death states or who were reborn in a certain way and then clearly remembered not only their previous life but also what happened to them in the between life and death state. Like remembered the dream, dream-like between state. And uh, then they came up with this uh, Book of the Dead. And, but although the Book of the Dead, the, the one that is well known, it takes some sort of these subtle bodies of Buddhas and fierce and peaceful, or I call mild and peaceful Buddhas, and uh, male and female Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and angels and things, and it sort of brings them into that intermediate dream state. And you creates a mandala out of the dream state in order to enable someone to navigate it optimally. It's really quite a marvelous thing, and it goes along with all the subtle body and super subtle body and super subtle mind yoga. And um, there are others, this is the famous one, but there are others in Tibet that are used by people who have different mandalas. 
who work with different depth psychological traditions. There's a whole host of them, thousands of them. All really developed in India, actually, which was the great scientific culture of ancient world and wealthy culture, the Indian ones. And Sanskrit was the great scientific language of all time. So, um, okay. So the Book of the Dead. So the Book of the Dead presents a kind of map. In the introductory study, I talk about the underlying model of the unconscious and everything that is used, you know, the process of dissolution. There's a very wonderful thing it's on page 42 of this text. So there's called the eight stages of death, dissolution and experiences. And they call them earth to water. The first one is earth to water. And then the person who has the earth to water experience has an inner experience. They lose their visual object at that time and their ability to discern things visually like, you know, like that's a pillar, that's a tree out there, this is a window, that's a floor. At that first melting stage, and therefore they hallucinate at that stage. Hallucination comes from when the brain cannot identify, organize the photons that are hitting the optic nerve, and it no longer can impose an image of like pillar and things on it. The routinized the imagination cannot take an image and control the flood of photons hitting the neurons the atomic, uh, you know, subatomic processes in the eye. And uh, so then the, this experience internally and subjectively as hallucination uh, or a mirage-like perception, you know, like everything like wavering and something like that. And then there's water to fire, and then one has an experience as if everything was smoky, uh, but no longer with the eyes, but in an inner vision, like mind's eye. And then there's the stage called fire to wind, and when they experience like Initially, it's like the, the, that smokiness, there's like some filled with like shooting sparks in the smokiness because there's a feeling of heat once you're around in the, with fire. But then since fire is dissolving to the cooling wind, that this spark-like thing changes to a swirl of fireflies. Have you ever seen hatching fireflies in a, in a swirl? Lots of them. It's amazing sight, actually. Those little flashing green lights, and then they're swirling like this. It's quite. A, it's like a moiré pattern of fireflies swirling. A water moiré pattern is also um, sometimes used as the inner sign, the inner vision of fire to wind. The third dissolution, and the fourth dissolution, is where the firefly thing solidifies into like a single, very cool flame, like a candle flame at the very end before it gutters out and stays very, doesn't flicker at all, and it's sort of a whitish, little tinge of yellow in it, but uh, not strong light, they say, and that's the fourth dissolution, and that's the end of the coarse mentality going along with the coarse body. And there's another set of things on the next page uh, where they connect those four dissolutions, first four, with um, the different senses, you know, the eye sense goes with the first one, then the hearing of the second one, the smell of the third one, tongue, the taste sense and the touch sense, the surface of the body, go together in the fourth one. And then the consciousnesses that are normally tied up with the five coarse senses, like right now you're seeing something and your mental consciousness is therefore aligned with your visual consciousness, although it's doing double duty because I'm talking and you're listening at the same time. <laughs> so it's trying to keep both of those things going. And your mental consciousness is really concentrating on that. And then maybe if you're being distracted by some inner thought and doubt or worry, then it's also having its own progression internally. You know, consciousness is this really complex uh, inner function, you know, in the mind, you know, at the core of the mind. And anyway, the course, its involvement with the core senses, which is a huge amount of its involvement in ordinary life, is disappears in that fourth dissolution. And then you go into this, what's called the subtle mind, which I, are explained here, I call them luminance, radiance, and imminence. The moonlit space or sky, the sunlit sky, and the dark lit sky, the midnight sky. Luminance, radiance, and imminence. The dark one is called imminence with an I, meaning there's a sense in it, although you go unconscious in part of it, there's a sense of something about to happen, which is why people fear being unconscious, because they're worried what might happen to them. They're not worrying the state of unconsciousness. They're just worrying what might happen to their non-unconscious sensitivity when they are not there, so to speak, when they are not in any kind of control. And um, that's imminence, a feeling of something about to happen. And then finally, imminence to translucency, which is where one hits the clear light of the clear pre-dawn sky. 
And those are the four. And of these, the three, five, six, and seven are the subtle mind. And they go along with another categorization that they use about the subtle body also. And the subtle body is something called, that's on page 37, or I describe it and analyze it. The subtle body are the nerve channels, that is to say the central nervous system, the neural energies, what they call or winds, but wind doesn't mean, you know, earth doesn't mean earth. Earth means hard, the quality of hardness. There is no atom of earth, actually. It's a quality of some atoms, which are coarse, divisible things, that is the hardness quality. In other words, the people using earth, water, fire, wind are aware that these are just abstract qualities. They are not actually a thing. There's no earth thing. A piece of dirt has earth qualities, water qualities, because it has cohesiveness. Uh, it has temperature, therefore heat qualities or fire qualities, wind qualities, which wind just means motion, that's all, or energy. There's probably all that energy means. And the neural drops, and drops are like hormonal substances. Uh, so channels, winds, uh, channels, energies, and drops is what the subtle body is. So how many of you ever read uh, Don Juan, you know, the Carlos Castaneda books years ago? I don't know if you remember, but he had a vision one time of Don Gennaro, the other uh, brujo along with Don Juan, as a ball of luminous fibers. I don't know if you might, might remember that. So the fi luminous fibers, this is the subtle body. It's the central nervous system, and, and which is not just the brain. Central nervous system is a whole nervous system. They say they have a token number, 72,000 channels, oriented around a central axis with these different chakras, what they call wheels or lotuses, at different heights of the central axis. And then the energies and drops are, drops are sort of lenses for consciousness to function, uh, but they are physical, and uh, they are like hormonal things, you know, uh, neurotransmitters and, neuro, and, and neural energies. That's the subtle body in which these three layers of light exist. And then the three layers of light, you know, white, red, and at the top moonlit one has 33 instinct patterns, which are desire-focused, lust-focused. The radiant sunlit one with the more harsh sunlight, bright reddish sunlight, have 40 instinct patterns with aggression emphasis. And then the dark light one has seven instinct patterns with a delusion or ignorance or unconsciousness emphasis or focus, you know. So there are those 80 instinctual surges there. Those are confronted and dealt with and you become conscious of them by inhabiting these bodies that you see in that art, you know, the erotic or the fierce body. Because to face your own inner aggression, you need to be feel that you're immune to that ferocity of that aggression. You had, so you inhabit a fierce form to overturn, being subjected to the fierce form, etc. It's very, very sophisticated. It really is. Jung was getting into it with his collective unconscious and uh, archetypes and this type of thing. He was getting into that. But, you know, he still was stuck in the idea that the consciousness, you always have to be unconscious and therefore you just want to see what comes out and he never learned that you can go in and you can restructure yourself with the mandala concept and with a different body image and all of this sort of thing. He, you know, he didn't, because he didn't have that kind of teaching at that time, you know. But he was going in that direction, definitely. If you ever read his memories, dreams, reflections, a little bit of a sort of semi-autobiography, he always used to dream he was going to India and that he'd been born in India, Jung did. He often did. He had a feeling he came from there. But then he had to be paranoid, like, I'm a Swiss, I'm a European, you know. We, we're different and all this. He got into that. Because <laughs> in those days, they still thought Europe was superior, even though they were having this crazy world war and they had been genociding people all over the planet for a long period of time. They still thought they were superior, just like I'm afraid many of us still might think that. If we have a World War III, we will be the inferior ones who destroyed the whole thing. Definitely. There'll be no question about it. Nobody else did that. Of course, we assume they didn't because they were too stupid. But actually, they weren't. They decided not to do that. Better to have, like, cage match. I always wanted to see Putin and W have a cage match. Maybe W will come out of retirement in between his painting and learn judo and have a cage match with Putin. Whoever wins, then they can have, I don't know, the bank or something. <laughs> whatever. Be the oligarch. Whatever they want. And then we don't have to destroy the whole planet. 
because of their stupid egos. So anyway, that's the subtle body and the subtle mind. Then the extremely subtle body mind, this is the dead level of deep mystery and clear light, but you're in it every day. That's what we're all made of. That's what it is. And the only way you know that, the extremely subtle body mind, the body, the extremely subtle body is pure energy at some stage where you don't know if it's a particle or a wave or what it is. And actually at that stage it doesn't, it, in a way, it's not really energy. Maybe I shouldn't use If Energy is motion because it's potential motion, but it isn't moving because it's infinite. It's like the quantum vacuum zero point, infinite energy of the quantum vacuum zero point that they're fooling around with, these quantum mathematicians and theorists. They've had this mathematical discovery that the zero has infinite potential energy. But, and it's not visible normally because it, once it's infinite, it doesn't have to do anything. Everything is already done everywhere. They're reaching into that kind of paradox, actually, mathematically. <laughs> I love it. But that's the clear light of the void. It's infinite energy that can be drawn on endlessly. It's the endless abundance of the universe. This infinite, everything's made of infinite energy. Every one of your atoms has infinite energy. Every one of your cells has infinite energy. You think it's very limited. Oh, it's running out, but it's infinite. But the super subtle mind is aware of that. But we are unconscious of it. It's totally subliminal to the ordinary ignorance-driven person or misknowledge-driven person who's only perceiving things in the sort of classical way, let's say, classical ignorant way. But the super self-aware wisdom-achieved yogi knows this. And they can, and the Buddha, that's where the Buddha, Buddha inhabits subtle and super subtle and coarse mind simultaneously. But to us, super subtle seems to be as if it was like a disappearing from the course, which is the death process. And death is defined actually as where the consciousness of the person hits the super subtle body mind, where body and mind are not different. This is another thing that Dalai Lama is being stingy about. He doesn't tell the scientists because he thinks they'll use it to be triumphalist about their materialism. Because at the super subtle level, at the deepest level of reality, mind and matter are the same. There's no duality of mind and matter. This, you like this. No duality of mind at that super subtle level. But that doesn't mean that materialistic reductionism is the truth. Because you can also, therefore, do mentalistic reductionism. You can say all matter is mind just as easily. You follow? Because the matter-mind duality is a dualistic. So if they're the same, you could go in either direction, relationally speaking, in the relational, superficial, illusory, conventional, dualistic context that is constituted by this non-dualistic level, but is dualistic. And you can go in either direction since none of those hypotheses will be the absolute law of nature or the absolute truth. Because the only absolute truth is the negation of all such seeming conceptual structures that seem to pretend to capture the true nature of reality. And the true nature of reality cannot be captured from outside by a concept like that. Non-dualism cannot be captured dualistically, but it can be non-dualistically experienced. How would you experience non, no non-dualism without being non-dual with it? You follow me? And the super subtle mind does that. And how does it do it? This is the beautiful thing. How does it do it? The subjectivity that knows the non-duality of the clear light of the void is, is pure bliss. Super bliss, actually. And how is super bliss defined? Super bliss is defined as melting of the boundary. So the supreme melting of all boundaries is super bliss. And when you supremely melt all boundaries, you melt all dualism and you're connected with the non-dualism. But the non-dualism is not apart from all the dualism. It's not a place apart. When we're looked at it from within dualism, it seems to be sort of the place of everything being ultimately reduced to. Moment of death even. But then death becomes the bliss state that permeates all reality when you reach it. You follow? So from its point of view, it's everything. Non-dually. You get it? I think you maybe get it. A little. But you can get it. But all the words are just, words are just vectors. They're vectors that skim past this, the experience, which is this uh, transcendent experience. You know, in Zen they call it, Satori, they call it the great death. Not just the death of a person that unconsciously passes through a boundary of leaving us one body and then grasping and scrambling to find another one because of being habituated to being in a body and being separate from a world that is not it. 
and trying to have a body that is more in control of relating to that world. That's an ordinary small death. Not the, the little, in French, the small death, of course, is orgasm, you know, that expression, the petit mort. But uh, that's a small, spiritually speaking, small death. And, but dying, normal dying by an ignorant person is a small death. But the great death is the death where death becomes all of life, non-dually, and therefore there's no fear of death. That's why Buddha said when he was enlightened, like an elixir of immortality is this reality I have discovered. And what he meant was, he realized that death is everything in life. It is the transformability of life. It is the inexpressibility. It is the blissful, infinite, quiescent, but infinite energy of reality, of the clear light of the void. He realized that. And that's immortality. If it's all already dead while alive, then a life is death, and there's no death as an opposite of life that you fear. You're dead and alive at the same time. So, okay. So this is just winding up a little bit for Book of the Dead. Now, the actual Book of the Dead, therefore, there are these six betweens. I only took this translation job because it drove me nuts that people call the between state the intermediate state. It really irritated me. It's like intermediate swimming, intermediate algebra. I don't know why. It's, of course, not wrong. It just irritated me. The word bardo in Tibetan means between. And why can't we call it the between? There could be songs. When you begin the between. <laughs> so I wanted to translate it so I could be going between, between, between. Because it's, it's an easy, nice word, between. And after death, before rebirth, betweens are three of them. There's the death point between, reality between, and existence between. And uh, those are the three that happen. Uh, the death point one is that one which is actually where de what is the definition of death, which is where there's a separation of, of the subtle, super subtle mind from the subtle and coarse body minds, both body minds. Super subtle mind goes beyond all of them. And so that's, that's the place where, although it, the subtle body mind is carried through that, but not the body, but the subtle mind is carried. The instincts of the subtle mind push past that without noticing it, put it that way. So that's the death point between. And in the Book of the Dead, they say that person who just dies can often stay three or four days in a state of clear light. But they are experiencing it as a state of darkness. They're still stuck in their subtle mind, and they just think they're just unconscious. They're unaware of being in the clear light because... Being in the clear light is they're vast and there's no sense of well, who they are or what they are. and they're, they're taught that that's a fearsome state. And so they're kind of in denial because they are only a subtle, super subtle mind sort of shields them from being aware of what they are and seeing it as filled with everything, something like that. So they're unconscious. They're separate from, they're in a simulated separation from where they really are, which is everywhere. And they're in a state of a sort of what they expect everywhere to be, something like that. Maybe that, you know, that helps. So you'd expect if you were everywhere, if you were infinite, you would expect that that infinity would have no nothing in it. It's this feeling that there's a vastness that has no differentiation in it. And so that's where they stay at death, which is a way of perpetuating their ignorance. Because actually they're in the clear light. And at the moment of clear light, they are everything and aware of everything. But their omniscience is experienced by them because they're afraid of it. Omniscience by omni-being, in a way you could say. But their bliss fusion with the infinite is experienced by them as a state of isolated unconsciousness. And they stay there for days because they're so frightened of that, supposedly. And the first part of the Tibetan Book of Natural Liberation tries to call out to them and attract their attention, but you can't really at that point. So in a way, it's really because they can't hear you. They, they, they are insensitive to you. But there's this stuff in the book of the Natural Liberation, which says, hey, noble one, you named Bob, listen here. Now the pure, clear light of reality dawns for you. Recognize it. Hey, noble one, this, your present, conscious, natural, clear, void awareness, this presence in clear voidness without any objectivity of substance, sign, or color, just this is the reality, the mother Buddha, all around goodness, the female Buddha all around goodness. 
So in other words, this vastness that you feel isolated in is not an isolation, it is, a, it is the mother, it is this membrane, the infinite membrane of the void, of nurturing infinite potential energy. But it seemingly has no objectivity of substance, sign, or color. This is the reality, the mother Buddha all around goodness. And this, your conscious awareness, natural voidness, not succumbing to a false annihilative voidness, which unfortunately the ordinary person does, just your own conscious awareness, unceasing, bright, distinct, and vibrant, just this awareness is the father, Buddha all around goodness. So just this presence of the indivisibility of your awareness is naturally in substantial voidness and the vibrant, bright presence of your conscious awareness, just this is the Buddha body of truth, body of reality. So you are in the infinite, what is called bliss, void, indivisible body of reality. You are that body, actually. You are one with it. It is you. Your awareness thus abides in this vast mass of light, of clarity, void, indivisible. In this one, they use clarity instead of bliss. Transparency instead of bliss. Because they are, you know, whatever, for the lay people. You are free of birth or death. Just this is the Buddha changeless, dualistic birth or death, that is. Just this is the Buddha changeless light. It is enough just to recognize this. Recognizing this, your own conscious awarenesses, purity, nature, as the Buddha yourself, beholding your own awareness. That is to dwell in the inner realization of all Buddhas. So they don't use bliss word because this is adapted to the ordinary people. And it might seem a little freakish to them that the ultimate nature of reality is infinite orgasm of father, mother, bliss melting. That might freak them out because they might think that that was something you do in hiding in your bedroom <laughs> in between cigarettes. So, but it's beautiful. It is really beautiful. But, but, you know, actually it's just kind of going through the motions, I have to say, because they know perfectly well and why they have the whole rest of the book of natural liberation that someone who doesn't know this before going there, you know, before dying, is not going to recognize it. And they can't hear the person saying that at this point, in the death point between. They, they won't be able to hear it. That's why they don't really elaborate it the way I did in the commentary. But I did it in the commentary that I gave here. I elaborated this so that it becomes something you can understand. Because when you read it, you're not dead. You're just barely not dead yet. <laughs> hey, noble one. Then some people who are close to meditate on this, your archetype deity. Don't be distracted. Aim your intense willpower toward your archetype deity. Meditate it as a parent, but reality less like the moon and water. Don't meditate it as material. So this means archetype deity means that kind of fierce deity form or male-female couple form, more likely, where you are both the mother and the father. Your subject-object duality has split into you as a unity, mother, father, bliss, orgasmic bliss, etc. And I give quite a lot of commentary explanation, which you can read. So then that's the death point between. Is, is there are those directions in the death point between. Actually, more important almost is before that one, you're telling, you know, the person when your breath stops, the objective clear light of the first or transparency of the first between will dawn as previously described to you by your teacher. Your outer breath stops and you experience reality stark and void like space. Your immaculate naked awareness dawning clear and void without horizon or center. At that instant, you yourself must recognize it as yourself. You must stay with that experience, so you can't be afraid of it if it's yourself. You yourself are this vastness. You're not this some little thing that is melting into the vastness. This way you can not, by denial, block yourself from melting through bliss into the vastness. And then you have this calling them into the dissolutions. Now this mirage you see is the sign of earth dissolving in water. The smoke is the sign of water dissolving into fire. The, these fireflies are the sign of fire dissolving into wind. This candle flame is the sign of wind dissolving into consciousness. This moonlit sky is the sign of consciousness dissolving into luminance. This sunlit sky is the sign of luminance dissolving into radiance. This dark sky is the sign of radiance dissolving into imminence. This pre-dawn twilight sky is the sign of imminence dissolving into clear light. And the clear light is where the darkness, there's no duality of dark and light which is why it's gray. You know, I have a student 
No, I graduated, no, he graduated a long time ago. He's a professor in Chicago now. It's a point of debate that we have. He wants to call the clear light not transparency, but he wants to call it brilliance. Because actually in German, brilliant means a diamond, right? And diamond is, it is, it is connected with the metaphor of a diamond. But diamond is only brilliant when you shine a light in it. It's the light from outside that makes the diamond seem brilliant. And I'm, I'm vetoing that as much as I, I actually originally decided, oh, that's called it brilliance because it's nice. Luminance, radiance, imminence, brilliance. Woo! <laughs> but I'm sorry, transparency is better because transparency means that it is like glass, you know. Glass is brilliant if you shine some crystal, is brilliant when you shine something on it. But, you know, then remember this whole physics thing. Dark energy is like stalking those, those guys, you know, mostly guys, physicists. Dark energy was discovered by a woman physicist in Cambridge, by the way. <laughs> because, you know, that's the yin side, you know, that's the female side. So, uh, yeah, clear light is not that. So, they, 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 in other words, those are people who came back. They didn't go all the way past death. If they'd hit the clear light, they would leave the, leave the body pretty much. But one thing that they do meet is what they meet is they meet, usually they meet some sort of protector or guide or guardian who is an angelic being, and in whatever culture they're in, they will think of it as a Christian angel or a Jewish angel or a Muslim angel. Or they, some of the more radical, absolutist ones, they don't like having intermediary angels so much. They're all worried about idolatry and things. But uh, there are all these intermediary beings and saints and things, and uh, they're trying to help people because actually that state for beings, especially human, but any being, that's the biggest quantum leap state. So if you were, if you were a person who was trying to guide, if you were like a charioteer, you know, a ferry boat driver, you know, who was a bodhisattva who wants to help beings evolve, that's the place where they can make quantum leaps in the evolution or really serious quantum falls. And so you want to be there to help them. You know? And um, then they are the often, remember, they often have a feeling that they're being sent back and they're not voluntarily wanting it because they've already... Why? Because even the bright light surface level of subtle mind is bliss. The bliss is happening. The drops, you know, and the energies that are going in the subtle neural channels are bliss drops and bliss energies, basically. You know. Provided by Tenzing Chogel. Used with the artist's permission, all rights reserved. To learn more, visit TenzingChogel.com. This podcast was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. For a complete listing of all upcoming events, please visit bobtherman.com. To learn about special intensive retreats and programs with Robert Thurman and friends at Menla, please visit menla.us. Located just two hours north of New York City in the heart of the Catskills. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Bob Thurman Podcast. Please be sure to like and subscribe on iTunes in your favorite podcasting platform.